Hello. One of the reasons I liked to deal with newspapers rather than just picking stuff up off the internet is the way newspapers format themselves when they're in print. When you're picking stuff off the internet, you just see one article. But when you get the newspaper, you'll discover that there's generally speaking a theme. Whether it's by accident or design, I can't say. But you will find that there's a story on one page and then there are different stories that sort of round it out on other pages. Round it out at least the way the editor wants it rounded out. Or perhaps it's just because all the reporters want to cover similar stories because they are the burning issues in the coffee room. Uh, you see, so this is the Sunday Telegraph rather than the Saturday Telegraph. What I do for my subscribers. I have actually subscribed myself to the Sunday Telegraph E edition and we'll see how that works itself out. Oh, and talking about subscribers, why not? Thank you to everybody, to those of you who subscribe to my channel and to those of you who subscribe and actually pay money over as well, which is extraordinarily generous of you. But those who don't, you can really help things by sharing as well. So here we are. This is the Sunday Telegraph. And this is the big story on the front. Well, actually, this is really the big story because inside the paper, there's a lot of news about the troubles going on inside the royal family with the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, who are having a tussle with the Queen about exactly how they can use their royal brand not being domiciled in Britain anymore and going off doing their own thing. And, well, every family has its rogues and, well, no, rogue is the wrong word. I mean rogue elements, not rogues, if you see what I mean. Uh, but the, 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 the Telegraph obviously wants to show that this is a family that's also settled and responsible. So this is the chat they put on the front of the paper. The Duke of Cambridge at a function for the Welsh Rugby Charitable Trust prior to kickoff. OK, that's uh, that's nice. It's just a reminder they're doing their stuff as well. But this is the story that really starts the the paper going. Top civil servants on Tories hit list. Boris Johnson wants to replace a series of mandarins as part of a move to change dramatically to change dramatically. Well, at least they haven't split that infinitive. The approach in some of Whitehall's most influential departments, Tory resources claim. Senior Tories said number 10 sees Sir Tom Scholar. It's a nice medieval name, isn't it? The Treasury Permanent Secretary, who previously led David Cameron's attempted renegotiations with the EU as offside on Brexit and his approach to the economy. So apparently, Sir Tom was... There's a poem by A.A. A. Milne. Of all, starting of all the night, of all the nights in Appledore, the wisest was Sir Thomas Tom. He could multiply as far as four and knew what nine was taken from to make eleven. I, I won't do any more of that. It just reminded me of it. Uh, you can look that up yourself. It's called The Knight Whose Armour Didn't Squeak, so far as I remember. Senior Tories said number 10 sees Sir Tom Scholar uh, as offside. You see, he was advising David Cameron. And as we all know, David Cameron 
had the referendum under the mistaken impression that the British were going to vote for Remain. He got the shock of his life when we didn't. And I suspect that Sir Tom Scholar was one of the people who assured him that this was not going to happen. Sir Tom is said to top a S list of permanent secretaries, number 10, once replaced, over claims they are significantly at odds with Tory ministers and advisers who've been buoyed by Mr Johnson's landslide election win. The disclosure comes after a major row between Priti Patel and Sir Philip Rutnam, another good name, but I don't know any poems about Phillips at the moment. I do know, though, that... <laughs> what, was it Jilliku... Um, uh, the, the the books featuring Rutshire, which were Jilly Cooper's uh, highly sex novels about country hunting, shooting and fishing types. And she called the place they lived Rutshire, which was obviously a uh, not very subtle play on words. The disclosure comes after a major row between Priti Patel and Sir Philip Rutnam, the Home Office Permanent Secretary, boiled over last week with the disclosure that the Home Secretary had attempted to remove her top official after a series of clashes. Sir Philip was accused of obstructing and undermining successive Home Secretaries. Now, it just so happens that somewhere further on in the paper, I'll get to that in a little while, there is an article about a television programme, supposedly a comedy, called Yes, Minister, which is all about civil servants obstructing what politicians can do. Uh, it is very, very funny but it has been called one of the best documentaries on the workings of the civil service ever made. I'll get to that uh, sooner or later, but this is what I mean when I'm talking about a theme. Now, Priti Patel has a reputation for being a bit of a loose cannon. She took a secret trip to Israel a couple of years ago. I don't think she, officially anyway, she didn't inform anyone and she met a, an Israeli politician described as centrist. But I don't remember his name. Anyway, she, she was forced to resign because she just took off on her own. But she is the sort of person who has little time for convention by the looks of things. Tory sources said Sir Tom and Sir Philip were among three permanent secretaries Downing Street wanted to replace, along with Sir Simon MacDonald. They're all the same age, aren't they? 51, 54, 58. There's not much between them. The most senior civil servant at the Foreign Office who worked alongside Mr Johnson when he was Foreign Secretary. In a separate clash, Baroness Morgan of Coates, the former Culture Secretary, today warns the BBC that reform of the corporation is unavoidable, adding the best way to tackle it is to start the ball rolling yourself. Well, what this has to do with replacing mandarins, I don't know, but they have stuck in this BBC thing as part of the the Telegraph obviously sees that as part of the battle between the vested interests in the British establishment and the Conservative Party, well, a Conservative Party, which is steadily starting to look more radical than we could possibly imagine. Writing in the Sunday Telegraph, Lady Morgan states that the next BBC Director General would best aid their cause by accepting that no change is not an option. All right, well, let's go to page five and continue with this Treasury Mandarin article. Scholar is offside completely on Brexit. The Treasury has done nothing but dig their heels in. Their view on the economy is now very different from the view in Downing Street. I can't see how he's going to carry on. So anyone reading The Telegraph is going to get the impression from all these little bits of news that they're reading that the whole 
government is against the whole civil service. It, I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. I'm just saying that this is a theme that develops in your mind as you read the paper. Brexiteers have repeatedly criticised the Treasury over its approach to EU negotiations and inadequate preparations for a no-deal split. Last night, a Whitehall source suggested Sir Tom enjoyed a positive relationship with Rishi Sunak, raising the prospect, he's the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, by the way, raising the prospect that the new Chancellor could argue for him to stay in post. The claims about Number 10's view of Sir Simon suggest the Foreign Office Mandarin will be asked to find a new role when his term finishes in August. A source suggested that Number 10's apparent objection to Sir Simon stemmed from Mr Johnson's time as Foreign Secretary. Bolish, Boris had a hellish time in the Foreign Office, a source said. An insider accused Mr Johnson of plotting to replace Sir Tom as part of a takeover of the Treasury designed to achieve ideological purity. So... There's another article here on a cut on alcohol tax. Whiskey is going to be cheaper. Gin's going to be cheaper. Well, I don't suppose people will object to that. And then there's this little thing here, which again is a sort of anti-EU article. Again, I'm not saying that the Telegraph is wrong. I'm just pointing out the theme of the story. Apparently, the EU made a ruling that ride on lawnmowers, golf carts, and tractors will be required to have motor insurance. It's a, an EU rule that's taking effect in the UK after Brexit, despite being described by Boris Johnson as insane. I'm not too sure about tractors, but they're trying to reduce the burden on farmers who are under a certain amount of financial pressure, just from the weather. But I can't see why a golf cart or a ride on lawnmower should ever have to have motor insurance. The rule in 2016, the government was required to carry out a consultation on introducing the EU rule in the UK. The rule followed a case involving Damijan Vnuk, a Slovenian man who was injured after falling from a ladder that was hit by a tractor trailer. Insurers refused to pay out because the accident took place on private property and involved a vehicle being used for farming but the ECJ ruled that it should have been covered by compulsory vehicle insurance. I think that the insurance company was wrong there, rather than the vehicle insurance business. Surely any accident that happens on your private property should be covered by some sort of insurance. I know when I took insurance on my house, one of the parts of the insurance, one of the basic parts was if, for instance, a tile fell off my roof and hit somebody or somebody's car, then that would be covered by my home insurance, my third party insurance. So I don't know what was going on with that. But, you know, insurance companies have their way. My horse had something wrong with it and my insurer and I had to have a lot of work done on his feet and now my insurance company have put my excess up to double what it was before the stinkers okay now what was the next page yes page 19 let's have a look at page 19 so there's an editorial here on page 19. The civil service must be rescued from itself. It is obvious that Whitehall needs radical reform, and it's no surprise that when someone tries to overhaul it, existing vested interests will protest. Such international internal sorry opposition from civil servants and quangocrats who have presided over endemic failure 
and who for too long have conducted themselves as if they, rather than elected politicians or the public, were in charge, merely confirms that change is needed. Well, yes, we've been talking about that to do with the civil service for years. And then down here, there's a, a little thing here about the EU in chaos. The government warns the EU is in disarray over Brexit negotiations. So here we have this whole civil service and EU stuff all being bundled together somehow. And the next article, ah, oh yeah, that was page 27, which was the little bit about Yes Minister. The political comedy that MPs have voted the greatest of all time. The consummate political satire might be about to celebrate its 40th anniversary, but in many ways it has barely aged at all, with its bungling ministers, obfuscatory civil servants and insider ring of truth. One of its major sources was Richard Crossman's Diaries of a Cabinet Minister. It feels as fresh and timely as ever. Uh, set in the fictional Department of Administrative Affairs, um, and it features Jim Hacker MP, whose attempts to get anything done were forever thwarted by the civil service in the form of verbose Mandarin, Sir Humphrey Appleby. That's Sir Humphrey Appleby, for those who've never seen it. A wily Whitehall operator determined to defend the status quo at all costs. Now, some of you who uh, live in America or other countries might not know this comedy, but I do know that in India they made an Indian version of it, practically verbatim. And the fact is that if you remember just before Donald Trump was elected, there's evidence that the civil service, so to speak, of the American establishment was also doing its best to interfere in the political process. So it seems as if that's what happens. And this little theme that's been running through the Telegraph forces you to think that there should be mechanisms in place to stop this happening. Right, now, what was the next one? Page 19. No, ah, page one. Let's go back to page one and take a look at this little article here. F fears over police AI to identify future criminals. Police are using artificial intelligence to predict which youngsters could be drawn into violent crime in a major government-funded trial. Officers are piloting a computer model designed to identify low-level offenders deemed likely to go on to commit high-harm crimes involving knives and guns. The scheme, which the Home Office wants to roll out to forces across the country, is highlighted in the biggest ever audit of police use of AI in this country by researchers at the Royal United Services Institute, the Defence and Security Think Tank. Now, this, you know, on the face of it, we're using AI. If you remember quite recently, in fact, just this week, there, or just last week, there was a case that came up in which a man had been advised to check his thinking by a police officer who had been trawling the Twitter feed, looking for stuff to feel offended by. Well, actually, it was reported in, but we know that the police trawl the Twitter feed as well. And, well, look, there are some, obviously, some very intelligent police officers, but there are also a lot of police officers who are as thick as bricks and they are given a program to follow basically they're told this is what they're supposed to do and they just do it and the the rule about hate crime there was somewhere in one of the 
list of things you were supposed to do was apply common sense. But obviously, this PC gull in the Harry Miller case had no common sense. And he just went through the programme because he didn't have the intelligence to apply his own common sense to the case. Now, this is to do with AI and AI has no common sense at all. And you, you've got to be very careful with stuff like this. Speaking as somebody who knows quite a lot about computers, um, we're basically a computer family. I was using email in the late 70s when it was just a university method of communication. Uh, we had a program called Eudora, I remember. That was one of the first. It wasn't the first, but it was one of the most efficient of, it was certainly the most efficient of the first. I wonder what's happened to you, Dora. Anyone who knows, who remembers you, Dora, make a comment. Anyway, I know a lot about how computers can get things wrong. And my husband, who knows even more, refuses to do certain things, which I do, you know, sort of internet, because he just doesn't trust the AI. Uh, the, uh, and he, he probably knows what he's doing. The RUSI report commissioned by the Center for Data Ethics, ha, there's an oxymoron, and innovation, a government body, warns of an absence of national guidelines to govern the use of algorithms, mathematical formulas, isn't, shouldn't that be formulae, used by computers to assist policing work, following a similar warning by Lord Evans of Weirdale, a former head of MI5. The report also highlights a lack of sufficient empirical evidence to help experts understand whether such algorithms are biased against certain groups. Now, I you know, these algorithms, uh, people have often spoken about being deplatformed in one way or the other because an algorithm got something wrong in their data. And one of the things that springs to mind, of course, is the town of Scunthorpe in Yorkshire which is a perfectly reasonable town filled by perfectly reasonable Yorkshire people who are constantly finding themselves deplatformed. I shall get the titles up and put Scunthorpe on the screen and you will see why. OK, now, what was the next thing I was going to do? Oh, yes, page three artificial pain. Now, here we have another AI thing. This might hurt a bite. Uh, let's see. Blade Runner Future of Andor Androids Indistinguishable from Humans a Step Closer as Machine Learns to Wince. Yeah, well, what we've got here is a machine that is making a, a movement, a motion that looks like a wince, but it isn't a wince. A future in which androids look and feel so much like humans that they start to believe they are actually alive, as depicted in the 1982 film Blade Runner, may soon be a reality. Scientists in Japan have invented a robot which can feel pain and is programmed to visibly wince when an electric charge is applied to its synthetic skin. No, it doesn't feel pain. It just gets a stimulation of a certain sort, which it knows it should translate into a grimace. That's all. It's no more feeling pain than a robot that's programmed to pick up bottles and put them on a tray uh, actually knows that it's a bottle that it's transferring. It just knows when its uh, claw goes down and closes on the bottleneck, it has to do that. That's all. Uh, uh, however, you see, we tend to anthropomorphize. Have I got that word? Anyway, you know what I mean. We tend to, I talk to my washing machine sometimes, you know, start, damn you, or why don't you finish, or 
or something like that. I talk to the coffee pot. You know, people do that sort of thing. And they even more, if it happens to look human, that's actually quite dangerous. But this uh, Blade Run, let's carry on. The team from Osaka University is hoping that coding pain sensors, and they're not pain sensors. They are reaction programs. Uh, will help them develop empathy to humans. No, they won't develop empathy. And actually, the point about Blade Runner, if you remember, it, it starts with, oh, what's the name of the, the guy? He's being quizzed. And at one point, the quizzer, who he's, the quizzer is trying to find out if he's an android and asking him a series of illogical questions. And these illogical questions are designed to elicit a reaction in some in a computer that doesn't understand illogic, that has no empathy. And at one point, the this uh, android breaks down. Hmm, what's he called? Hmm. And I'm sure somebody will will put that down in the comments. The questioner finally says, tell me about your mother. And then this android says, I'll tell you about my mother and goes completely mad. And that's because he really cannot understand empathy. That's the whole point of the synthetic aspect. Now, the interesting thing is at the end, when Roy appears to feel empathy with Decker and rescues him. Had, he, had Roy had a complete lack of empathy, then he would have just let Decker fall. But then you, you don't know. It's a question literally in the air because he makes this speech you don't know whether it's empathy or whether Roy is just trying to pass something on at that point. He's had these experiences and he doesn't want them to die. As he says, like tears in the rain. So whether it's empathy or simply a wish to hand something on, we, we will not know. But certainly... These machines here are not, but you know, you, you can sort of imagine that Roy might have empathy because he isn't actually a robot, is he? He is a synthetically cloned human, but he's made in vats, not in machine part factories. So this is definitely not the same. Uh, in Blade Runner, Android, you see, they've got the whole point of the androids wrong here. We are embedding a touch and pain nervous system into the robot to make the robot feel pain. No, to react as if it feels pain is what they're doing so that it can understand the touch and pain in others. No, it can't. And if this is possible, we want to see if empathy and morality can emerge. No, it can't. A robot can follow rules, you know, the three rules, uh, the Asimov three rules of robotics. It can do that. But a robot like this can never feel empathy. It can only react as if it does. And then we're into the, the Turing question of whether that's the same thing. Anyway, right. And then we can go to page... 19 in which they discuss artificial pain and I, I keep saying it's not artificial pain this is uh, one of the editorials thanks to artificial intelligence man has become god no we haven't we're nowhere near god Nowhere near God. I think Jordan Peterson actually uh, talked about how it turned out to be far more complicated than anyone ever imagined. And uh, the, the Telegraph has it wrong here. Uh, man has become God. No, no, 
No, man has just become very good at making machines. And having created robots, what will we do with them? The Japanese scientists are trying to make them sensitive to pain. No, apparently sensitive to pain. It's not the same thing. Or at least have them react to being struck react to being struck as if they were hurt. But why? If God were designing human beings from scratch, wouldn't we prefer not to feel pain? You know what? There are some people who have a condition in which they don't feel pain. And they live terrible lives because when you're not careful, when you don't feel pain, you're not careful with your body and you damage it. In fact, leprosy is such a horribly disfiguring disease because it destroys nerves and people are constantly damaging themselves and getting infections and not realizing it and so they you know as well as cutting off the blood supply to the extremities which is why uh, they lose fingers and things like that but just generally uh, that's one of the problems with not experiencing pain. It is argued that if robots understand pain, then they'll treat human beings more sensitively. No, they will treat human beings more sensitively if they are programmed to do so. But that requires development of something currently beyond the ken of science, empathy. Yeah, well, we were discussing that before. What is it that makes us wince when someone else steps on when someone else steps on a Lego brick. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. And what makes us laugh when somebody slips on a banana skin? The human mind is a very weird thing. So if we wanted to make computers feel empathy, well, artificial constructs feel empathy, they would have to not only feel sympathetic pain about somebody standing on a Lego brick, but also they would have to understand amusement when somebody else slips on a, tom uh, on a banana skin or laugh when Hardy hits Laurel with a plank as he turns round. You know, we've not become God by any means. All right. Oh, and I've just noticed talking about talking about the establishment and finding fights to pick with vested interests. Here, there's another article <coughs> about the BBC. No change is not an option for the corporation. I missed that one. OK, well, there's a bit more of your theme on the, the government and radical change in the establishment. Now, oh, yes, page two. We're talking about AI. Oh, I'm going to get to that in a minute. We're talking about AI again and criminals of the future. And here we have this. Social workers could be damaging children by subjecting them to an unproven trauma checklist intended to predict mental health, mental ill health and problematic behaviour. Again, we've got this prediction thing, which I was talking about with uh, earlier on, on page one about AI predicting future criminals. Experts warned about the increasing use of the so-called ACE adverse childhood experiences questionnaire, which they say risks alienating and re-traumatizing vulnerable minors. I don't know if uh, any of you have know about the diversity training questionnaires, which are supposed to find out that you're a racist. Not if you are, but that you are. And again, you can make these questionnaires such that you get the response you want. And if this looks, it says here, the 10 point list quizzes children on their exposure to a range of negative scenarios. So you're putting these in the mind. Uh, uh, some of you will remember the satanic abuse hysteria that hit 
the Western world was, I know it hit America and Britain. I don't know about the rest of, uh, of Europe or Australia, but certainly America or Britain, where children were sort of coming up with stuff about abuse that was happening to them in their nursery school. And what happened was the police went in there and asked these kids questions, which the children answered because it, it, it very much seems like they were being prompted to answer. And the children thought they were doing the right thing by cooperating with the questioners in giving the questioners the answers that they obviously wanted. And this caused a number of perfectly innocent, generally speaking, women. It was definitely a witch hunt in the classical sense. Uh, they're, they're being thrown in jail for hundreds of years. Literally, that was their sentences for all the nasty things they were doing. And I believe one town in America dug up their entire main street because the, these children said there were these caves underneath it where they were taken and where sacrifices and sodomy were being carried out. And you have to be very careful about these sort of checklists. However, an investigation by the Early Intervention Foundation reveals major gaps in the evidence justifying routine use of the questionnaire. Dr. Kirsten Asmundson, the report's lead author, said the ACEs were harmful. I'll bet they are, and questioned their value in predicting future ill health and um, ill health and adversity. Now, ill health, yeah, I don't understand what adversity is. Anyway, uh, that's it. So I'll finish with my fashion picture. This is a model during the Bottega Veneta show at Milan Fashion Week. I wonder if I can hang on a minute. I'll, um, I'll, I'll make this picture a bit smaller so we can get the whole thing, I hope. Here we are. Here's this, this picture and the Bottega Veneta show at Milan Fashion Week. The Yorkshire-born head designer Daniel Lee uh, has been credited with reinvigorating the Italian brand. Now, first of all, in the light of the coronavirus, which is doing the rounds here, I think maybe a completely red outfit is probably not as tactful as it could be. Uh, I remember a film called The Mask of the Red Death. Vincent Price was in it, wasn't it? It wasn't a marvellous film, uh, but it was based on an interesting Edgar Allan Poe story. And this reminded me of it straight away, especially as she's wearing what appear to be the sort of boots you wear in as part of your isolation kit when you're in a plague area. So I thought that was rather funny. And these are sequins, but they do look a bit like shiny plastic, don't they? So altogether... Um, all she needs is a hood. And we have our, well, you know, a true genius is somebody who manages to predict the future. So perhaps uh, Daniel Lee comes from Yorkshire, so he's got to be a good guy, hasn't he? Perhaps Daniel Lee is a genius. And that's it. If you want to donate or contact, the information will be rolling over the Granny Opteryx as I speak. Please like, subscribe and share because it does help with the algorithm. If you visit my channel on YouTube and one day discover that I've disappeared without warning, you'll still find me on BitChute or Minds. Just go to either of those platforms and do a search for Granny Opteryx. If you're already watching this on BitChute or Minds, good for you. Meanwhile, if you're watching this on YouTube, remember that you must keep checking the subscribe and bell icons because occasionally they reset. Till next time.